Hi everyone, uh, glad to see you all today and uh, welcome to our next Coffee Jack online event. Today we have amazing speaker, developer advocate from IBM, Grace Jensen. She will join just in a second and traditionally our opening uh, ceremony, right? So welcome to Coffee Jack. Here are our address, you can check our other events, photos and all video materials are there. So why we do this and actually, of course, you know, this slide is all about community. That's the already 21 events in the past and we already have a 500 and plus participants uh, through the all event, through the whole period of time. Almost two years we do this and we really appreciate to grow uh, engineers, share experience and of course invite amazing speakers uh, around the world. So, uh, here are the slides of our organizers. Hope you already know these faces. Anyway, that's we are. But also we have the program committee, Olaysa and Alexi, who always ready to help uh, and uh, make a trial run of the presentation for young speakers, but not only for young, for those who need any assistance to prepare their talk, especially new talk. These two guys really appreciate your help. So, Many thanks to our partners, Avanga, Sombra, Grid Dynamics, and Logica. That's really cool to have uh, great companies with us today. So many thanks. And of course, thanks to just a second. What? Uh -huh. Yeah, to our community partner, JetBrains. And uh, actually, everyone who will fill the feedback form about this talk uh, will automatically participate in a randomizer to one one year free license from JetBrains. So be uh, responsive and send us your feedback. Uh, and also this, this is like a small update from our side. Uh, this time we trying to support others. And uh, there are such initiative in here in Ukraine to help uh, children who has cancer. Uh, so if you are like want to help, we have a goal to collect uh, 10,000 hryvnia during the summer. Please use this uh, QR code and uh, just uh, send them uh, a bunch of hryvnias, right? 10, I don't know, 20, 50, 100. It doesn't matter because we just aimed to help. That's a great initiative from our side as well. So, active bonuses as usually. Please uh, listen and talk uh, and ask questions. And uh, the best questions will won a great, uh, I don't know, uh, tasty things from, from Coffee Jack that we can deliver or, uh, I don't know, uh, bring to you directly. So, join us. Thank you. See you right after Gray's talk and have a nice evening.
screen. So yeah, go ahead. So hi everyone and welcome to this talk. Uh, thank you so much to Coffee Jug for inviting me to come and present. Uh, I might have seen some of you at uh, some other conferences in the area. So hi again if I have. Uh, this session I'm going to be talking through sort of how we can replicate production on your laptop using the magic of containers. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Grace Jansen. I'm a developer advocate at IBM uh, based out of the UK, um, and I primarily talk and, and sort of do developer advocacy, so writing tutorials, guides, articles, um, and going to developer events about sort of Java-specific technologies, JVM technologies, reactive technologies, and the cloud. And so it all kind of comes together in this form of testing, because obviously, no matter what your application is, um, or what it's written on, or where it's based, obviously, all applications need to be tested. And so, yeah, it sort of piqued my interest and I started digging into, okay, how can we really utilize the magic of containers to make our tests even better? So without further ado, I'll get started. Um, I'll try and get around to all your questions if I can at the end. If I can't, um, I think my Twitter handle's at the very end. It's at Grace Jansen 27. I think Coffee Jug have tagged me in some of their tweets. So you should be able to find me there. Uh, and I am happy to answer additional questions or discussion points on Twitter as well. So tests, why do we write automated tests? So if we were all perfect developers, we would just write code and we'd push it up and deploy it immediately into production, probably on a Friday afternoon, and we would not get any calls at 2 a.m. for support. Unfortunately, we don't live in this perfect world um, and this isn't the case. None of us are perfect. None of our systems are perfect all the way through. So we need to write tests. Um, and why do we need to write them? Well, we need to write them so that we have the confidence that our applications work the way we want them to work. It's about ensuring that what we, the behaviors we were expecting to happen do occur and that we're not facing any potential failures or contention points or basically creating unresponsive applications that our users just can't use. So testing is important. What are the different kinds of tests we can use? You're probably familiar with this sort of, uh, with the, well, at least the different types of tests, and you may have seen a similar sort of pyramid scheme before. So there are, I would say, three main types of tests. You've got unit tests. Uh, unit tests are sort of typically automated tests that are written and run usually by software developers. And the whole point of unit tests is to ensure that a really small section of an application known as the unit, hence the name, meets its design and behaves as it's been intended to. So it's often sort of written and, and run by software developers uh, and it's at the base of this pyramid because it's usually um, and, and sort of recommended to be the one with the most number of, of tests. They're fairly small, they're fairly easy to run, doesn't require much resource, and we do need to test that each function within our application works. So that's unit testing. Then on top of that, we've got integration testing. So again, you, many of you probably use this. It's a level of software testing where sort of all of these individual units or, or components are combined and they're tested as a group this time. And the purpose of this is really to um, sort of expose faults within the interaction between these integrated units. So we've worked, we've used unit tests to check that they work by themselves. Integration testing is really about testing. Do they work as a group um, and perform the function of that particular component altogether. And then we've got, um, and sort of there, the next one up in the pyramid, because again, we want more unit tests than integration tests, because integration tests require more resource, more time, more effort, uh, but we do need integration tests in there too. And then at the very top, we have system or UI, or some people call them end-to-end -end testing, which as the name suggests, is literally testing your entire application end-to-end -end as it would be in production. And it's at the very top of our pyramid because it's it's fairly expensive to do. It re requires a lot of energy, a lot of resources in comparison to the other two types of testing. And so you don't necessarily want to do this all the time. And so we want less system or UI tests than we do integration tests, than we do unit tests, hence the pyramid and hence the sizing. But in reality, um, you know, we, ha we, we are striving for this balanced mix of these various different types of automated tests to be able to capture the areas at the different levels. 
the exact composition of how many of each you have will probably vary depending on sort of the nature of the project and the type of application you're developing. But in general, this is sort of what we're striving towards. But in reality, what do we actually have time to do? What do we actually do in terms of testing? Our triangles or our pyramids usually look a bit more like this. So this is a more realistic interpretation of the type of testing we do. We're able to write unit tests right away because they're fairly simple and we're able to do it as we develop the code, more sort of TDD driven development. Um, and because we're able to do this, it's much easier to do and we're able to create more of them and we spend enough sort of dedicated time towards them. Then we get on to integration testing. Integration testing requires a bit more thought. Um, we have to dedicate time towards it. Uh, and again, the same thing with sort of system testing. System testing, again, is harder. Uh, we have to really dedicate time and resources towards it. And a lot of the times it's manual. So it requires that we sort of dedicate time to it and remember to do it. It's not necessarily automated as it should be. So it's much harder to fit in uh, sort of the allocated time we need for integrate to, to do this integration and this system or end-to-end -end testing. But the problem with this is that if we were just to use unit tests and we don't spend enough time on the other two, then we get something like this. So this is a picture of a sync. Uh, and actually, if we were just to test the sync with unit tests, it would pass. The tap turns on. Well, yeah, the tap turns off. Trust me, it does. Uh, the drain works and the sink doesn't overflow. But actually, when you look at all of these components together, this is a fairly useless sink. I can't fit my hands under there. I can't wash my hands. I can't fill up a glass. It doesn't provide the functionality that a sink should. It doesn't work as a whole when you integrate all the parts together. So it's really important that we don't just focus on unit tests and that we do integrate the other types of testing and that we do dedicate time um, either whether that's as managers to our development team or as developers ourselves to spend time to do the additional integration tests and end-to-end -end testing. And actually, integration tests is where we're going to be looking today. So we're going to take a look at how we can create sort of automated integration testing that's as close to production by using containers. So why containers? Well, let's take a look at sort of a brief history of containers and where we're at. So the concept of containers was started way, way back in, I say way, way back for computing, in 1979 with sort of Unix's uh, CH root. So Unix v7 uh, was introduced in 1979 and the CH root system was introduced as part of that. And this sort of changed the root directory uh, as part of a process and, and its children to a new location in the file system. After that, we had sort of various iterations. So we had things like um, Virtuoso, Linux vServer, uh, OpenVZ, and then eventually, by the time we get to 2006, we get the next sort of jump forward in containerization technology. So this comes with sort of process containers. So process containers were something that were launched by Google in 2006. You can see that in the diagram, I've highlighted it. So we've gone from Unix to that Google jump. Um, and these were designed for limiting and accounting and isolating resources or resource usage. So things like CPU, memory, disk IO, networking um, of a collection of processes. So it was then later on renamed to control groups, which you might be familiar with, to avoid sort of a confusion with multiple different meanings of the term container in the Linux kernel. So then we had this move from Google, which really helped us. And then after that, we had LXC Linux containers in 2008. Again, you can see it on this timeline here. And this was actually the first sort of most complete implementation of the Linux container manager. Um, it was implemented in 2008, again, using these control groups that Google introduced. And it also used something called Linux namespaces. It worked on a single Linux kernel without requiring any patches. And it really paved the way for all of the different container technologies we see today, including things like Docker, Cloud Foundry, Rocket, etc. So moving forwards from these Linux containers, we now have technologies like Docker and Kubernetes, which many of us are probably using today. Docker obviously being sort of a, a PaaS service, so platform as a service, and it's a product that uses OS level virtualization to be able to deliver uh, software in packages called containers, hence this sort of containerization that we now speak about. And then we have Kubernetes, which is essentially a, an open source orchestration system for automating and managing and scaling and deploying these containers. 
And many of us will use these technologies today. And what does this actually offer us? Why have we made this move to containers? Why does it matter? Well, containers are magic. When you actually think about it, containers have offered us huge benefits and advantages when we're deploying our applications, especially when we're using cloud infrastructure. So what is the magic of containers? What does it offer us? Well, it offers us virtualization from that OS level, which makes them these sort of packages extremely lightweight and a much faster startup time than perhaps sort of previous iterations of sort of packaging solutions like VMs would have. It means that they're really portable with images and config files. We can utilize things like Docker file for that. We're able to run them anywhere. So they're extremely portable and flexible in terms of what they're running on, whether that's a particular stack of technologies or whether that's a particular cloud platform or the infrastructure underneath. It allows us to isolate the components of our application. And um, it sort of helps us to be able to isolate the various components so that we're not creating failures across the board and that we can really ensure that everything we need for that application is within that isolated package. However, it does come with some complexity, so that is something we do need to be aware of. Okay, so we've looked at the magic of containers. What about utilizing sort of these management systems like Kubernetes? Well, that also gives us more magic. We're able to now automate rollouts and rollbacks we're able to automate the scaling of services to be able to sort of automatically manage load within our system to be able to increase dynamically and decrease the associated services uh, based on that load. We're able to do health monitoring. Now that we're distributing our application in the cloud, it's really important that we're able to monitor the health of the various components within our application so that we can check they're still up and running and that our, our users aren't getting an unresponsive application. We're also able to use declarative management and as I said, deploy anywhere. And that can also be hybrid deployments. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be on cloud. So what magic can we use as developers when we're utilizing containers and management systems like Kubernetes and Docker? Well, it means that we can isolate our development environments. We can have these isolated, you know, it's full isolation, like I mentioned. Portability is a big thing. I'm going to combine that with flexibility being able to deploy to various different environments in various different platforms using various different tools. We can have pre-configured images available to make it really easy to be able to use them and fast startup of applications, which is really important in this sort of modern day society when our users expect things to be available literally at the click of a button. And you know, fast startup time is really important if we want to have agile development. We also don't need to have so many prereqs installed on our local machine. Uh, we're able to do version control, as you mentioned, of dependencies. And actually, the ones I'm interested in today are the bottom two. We can easily develop in the cloud, and we can achieve this true to production testing. So I'm going to take a look at how the magic of containers and automation technology can enable us to really mimic how our applications run in the cloud and run in a production state so that we can really test them as close to production as possible. Now, why is testing them? as true to production testing important. Well, if we take a look at the 12 factor app methodology, it's actually listed as one of those factors. So if you've not taken a look at this before, uh, head to the 12 factor app website and it takes you through each of these factors. Essentially, this is a methodology that's been introduced to be sort of extremely agnostic. So it's not language specific or technology specific or cloud platform specific. It's just a set of factors or behaviors or characteristics you need to think about in order to produce applications that are really able to thrive in the cloud. And so one of those factors is actually dev prod parity. Now, what do I mean by that? Dev prod parity, I have a basic definition here. You can read up about it more online if you want to take a deeper look. Essentially, it's all about keeping the various different environments you have as similar as possible. And that includes development, staging, production. It also includes QA um, or user testing. Like there's, there's a variety of environments you can have, but it's essentially about keeping them as similar as possible. And that's because when you don't make them as similar as possible, you get these three common issues that can mean that you know, the various environments are different and thus you get different results when you deploy your application to those environments. The time gap. So depending on when you deploy to your own, say, uh, development environment versus your production environment, 
the, the time gap between those could potentially mean that you have errors that you may not have accounted for within that. Uh, perhaps a, uh, a, a de dependency, for example, is not available anymore or um, something's timed out in the meantime. This time gap can be an issue. Personnel gap. Are you the same person deploying to development as you are to production? If it's not the same person, which it often isn't in sort of um, sort of large organizations, then that personnel gap between the two various environments can mean that perhaps configuration is different or perhaps they uh, deploy the application in different ways. And so that's an issue as well. And then you've got the tools gap. So you might not be using the same tools in development as in production, because it might be that you, you have one software stack running locally, which is faster and more convenient for you for your development environment, but actually you need a more robust software for your stack in production. And so you have this tools gap between the two, which means that it's not the same and could cause potential uh, issues to, or errors to be missed. So really the 12 factor developer should resist the urge as it says at the bottom here, to use different backing services between development and production, even when adapters theoretically abstract away any differences in backing services. It's to get rid of this saying, well, it works on my machine. It should work on every machine. That's that your application should be robust and reliable no matter where you're deploying it. So it's really important that we're able to test our application in an environment that's as close as possible to production. And we can do this with containers. So testing problems that containers can solve. Well, containers can help us to have access for data to things like databases that we might not be able to say, spin up locally in the same way. We're also able to do better integration testing. We're able to do automatic updating and version control. Like we mentioned, that's one of the best benefits of using containers. We're also able to minimize that complex setup on local machines because it's all set up within that container for us already and we're able to make a portable. So you're able to port this testing environment so that others can run the same test in the same environment in the same way, just as easily. And so you're able to sort of replicate any error messages, for example, really easily. So not only does it get rid of like, it works on my machine, it also gets rid of the whole, well, it doesn't work in my environment. Why is it working on yours? It gets rid of these sort of annoying little glitches that we find when our environments don't match up. So how do we actually go about doing this? Well, test containers, as the name suggests, is all about testing in containers. And so this is a Java library that really provides um, lightweight, throwable instances, throwaway instances of anything that can run in a Docker container and that supports JUnit. So it's all about utilizing those unit tests to provide integration tests because we're testing those parts um, as a whole, for example, or as a component altogether to test their integration. And we do this by integrating it with other backing services, for example, that you'd use in production that you need to test your application with. So that's why the containers can really help with that. So test containers, as I said, really easy integration tests that are easy to set up, write and run. And it tests your application the exact same way it would be running in production because it's literally able to go and deploy the same type of container with the same backing uh, services that you might be using in production. And it can make this easier, um, as I said, by having that data access layer to the integration tests. Um, application integration tests can be made easier with it. UI and acceptance tests can also be made easier with it. Um, and it allows for much more controlled modules and it supports tests like uh, JUnit 4 or 5 and SPOP. So there's a variety of tests you can run within it. Those tests um, really give you the ability to do sort of acceptance testing within a container which means that you know you have these great benefits like a fresh instance of a browser, for example, no browser state, uh, plugin variations or browser updates, um, and you can video recording of test session or you can video record a, a failed test session, for example. So these tests are portable to any compatible implementation. So there are various different implementations that you can utilize, Liberty, Wildfly, Pyara, Tommy E, um, and actually we're gonna be utilizing our open Liberty implementation in our live demo today which you can also join in with if you're interested. So as well as sort of the main benefits or, and the main advantages of sort of creating this container, there are also additional test container modules that allow you to connect in with those various different backing services. So here are some of the database modules that you can make use of, including things like uh, MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres, Couchbase, and DB2. 
There's also other modules that you can connect into if these are backing services that you're using. Things like uh, Docker Compose, Elasticsearch, Kafka, which is obviously a really popular tool at the moment, NGINX and RabbitMQ. These are all really important because it allows you to test that integration between them as it would be running in production. And the one that we're going to be taking a look at today is Microshed testing, which is essentially a version of test containers. So what is Microshed testing? Well, here is a basic definition. It's a framework uh, that works with many different Jakarta EE and MicroProfile runtimes, including Open Liberty. And it's really there to provide that integration with applications, um, and it uses Apache Kafka for messaging. So this framework allows that true to production integration test, which is what we're looking at on your local machine. It enables the developer to minimize the amount of test failures due to differences, as we were saying, between those various different environments, limiting that dead prod parity. And it uses the magic of containers so that we can replicate everything that we have in our production environment without much setup uh, for us locally at all. Microshed testing utilizes annotations. So here are some examples that we're going to be taking a look at in closer detail in this lab today. So in order to utilize Microshed testing, we have to make use of the app Microshed test annotation. This is essentially required so that the build knows that this is a Microshed test. You then need to use the app container annotation, obviously important because we want to be using containers to test our application. This app container annotation is required for setting up the container that you're going to use to run your tests inside. In order to run those tests, we need to utilize uh, things like the at rest client annotation. And this is needed so that we have something to run the test against. And then when we actually want to do a test, we need to use the at test annotation, just like you normally would. Um, and this is sort of normal if you're utilizing things like JUnit testing, you will be familiar with this annotation. So that at test just shows each of the various tests that you want to be run within that container. And all of these annotations we're going to be utilizing when we create the test within our application in a moment. Not only that, though, the really clever thing about Microshed testing is that we're also sort of as well as creating these containers, uh, collating together and connecting to and integrating with those additional um, sort of resources and components like Kafka, for example. It's important that we try and minimize uh, the number of containers, for example, we're running when we are trying to test our application. We don't want an application to be spinning up a container for every single test that we're trying to run. If we're able to utilize the same container with the same configuration values and the same setup for multiple tests, that means we're able to be much more effective in terms of the resource usage when we're trying to test our application and minimizing that resource usage so that we don't make it sort of too large a task or take up too much resources or cost too much to test our application. And to do this, we can utilize Microshed Testing's shareable configuration. So in this case, if multiple test classes can share the same container instance, they can then offload their app container annotation field to a completely separate class. So we can essentially set up the container configuration in a completely different class and then share that between all of the test classes that we want to utilize the same container instance. And that makes it really resource efficient. As I said, you can also utilize, as well as test containers, you can utilize Microshed testing in all of these various runtimes that are available. And we're going to be focusing on Open Liberty today, which is our open source application server from IBM. So it's completely open source. Everything we'll be doing today is open source. So true production testing with Microshed testing. So we're going to be utilizing the Skills Network Lab today. Uh, and this is an online environment that we created, which basically means that for the purposes of this lab, you don't have to have any pre-requirements. So it's an online environment we've created that runs on IBM Cloud, and it utilizes things like um, Eclipse J to be able to provide you with an online IDE for you to be able to edit the code um, and see the results of that in an online terminal. So to get there, uh, it, sorry, the, the environment's going to look a bit like this. So you'll see the instructions on the left-hand side, and you'll see the IDE and the terminal on the right-hand side. And you'll also be able to access um, the file structure as well using the Explorer function within this IDE. So without further ado, we're going to have a go at this demo. As I said, you guys can get interactive with it. So if you'd like to do this demo alongside me, then you can visit the link I provided here. Um, so you need to go to openliberty.skillsnetwork.site slash cloud-native-java-made-easy-microprofile-justjakarta-ee. So you should be able to plug that in fairly easily into your browsers, and it will take you to our online environment. If you don't want to sort of 
do it alongside me. That's absolutely fine. I'll be doing it myself and you can just watch whilst I do it. Now, this link takes you to a workshop page and we're going to be doing one module within this workshop page. If you're interested in more of the cloud native labs that we have on here, feel free to do those after this session. The link will stay open. Uh, we don't plan to close it anytime soon. So go ahead and, and feel free to complete those other labs. We, we look at various things, a lot of micro profile um, APIs and Jakarta EE APIs, uh, as the name suggests. So if you're interested in any of those, feel free to do those afterwards. Uh, the one we're going to be doing today is turning a normal J unit test into a micro shed test. So really looking at, OK, if I had a J unit test in my normal container, in my normal sort of application that I normally run locally, how can I then utilize the magic of containers to be able to run in this more true to production environment the same tests? So without further ado, I'm going to switch to my browser to be able to show you uh, essentially what it looks like. So when you go to that link, you should come to this page. So we're looking at the cloud native Java made easy with micro profile and Jakarta EE lab. And as you can see here, there are various different modules that you can take a look at. The one we're going to be doing is this one here underneath the automating true to production testing using containers. And it's the one that's called testing a micro profile or Jakarta EE application. When you hit that, it will ask you to log in with a social login, select any of the ones that you'd like to. Um, and then once you've logged in, it will then ask you about, you know, are you a robot? Please select no. And then you can go in and it will take you into that online environment. So here, the terminal probably isn't up when you log in. So to get that terminal to appear, you need to go to terminal and then just select new terminal and it'll appear at the bottom on the right hand side here. So hopefully I've given everyone enough time to get started. We're just going to do a general intro. So you've still got time if you'd like to go and visit that link and um, sort of do this alongside me. So we're just going to skip that first page because it essentially describes the environment and I've already done that for you. So we're going to be starting this application with an existing REST application and that's running on Open Liberty. And we're going to be utilizing Microshed testing to be able to write tests for that application that exercise it inside of a Docker container. And this is all about minimizing that their parity as the next paragraph suggests. So let's continue. So to get started, we're going to be utilizing the commands that we have on the left hand side here. We've tried to make it as easy as possible. So any commands that you need will be in one of these white boxes. And to copy them, instead of having to like highlight and then right click and copy or whatever or shortcut, we've just created a copy button on the right hand side. That just copies everything that's in that box for you. So if you copy that and then select into the terminal using whatever you'd like, whether that's a shortcut or a right click and paste, paste it in and then click enter, just works like a normal terminal would. So we're just double checking that we're in the right directory here. And then we're going to git clone the repository that we have available. So we get cloning this repository, which is open source. If you want to go and take a look at it, absolutely go for it. It's on GitHub. Uh, it's called Guide Microshed Testing because all of these labs are based on our Open Liberty guides. If you're interested in those, you can head to openliberty.io slash guides. And we have many, many more guides that are available there that you can also do locally on your own machine. We're then going to CD into that repository just so we're in the right place. Now, in all of our guides, including this lab, we have two main directories. We've got the start directory and the finish directory. The start directory contains the starting project that we're going to be building upon through the steps in this lab to then get to the same stage as the finish directory. As the name suggests, it's essentially what our application should look like once we finish this lab. So if you do want to try what you're going to be building, you could always head straight to the finish directory and try it out as the steps down in this left hand side um, tell you how to do essentially. We're not going to do that just for the sake of time. We're just going to skip straight to going into our start directory and building this project up. So taking that JUnit test and introducing that containerization. So to do that, we need to navigate to the start directory. So you can either just CD start or utilize the commands we have in case you've gone into finish. It can be useful utilizing the commands we've, we've, we've got on the screen and the instructions. Now we're going to be utilizing Open Liberty dev mode for this. So this is our development mode. We shorten it to dev mode. And essentially, this is allowing the server to listen for file changes and to automatically recompile and deploy our updates whenever we save a new change. So it really allows very rapid iterative development. So in order to run Open Liberty, uh, which is the application server we're using in this lab, 
in dev mode, we just have to use this maven command. Um, so if you copy and paste that in and press enter, it will start setting everything up for you. Now, in order to know when that's up and running and ready, you'll see the following message. Uh, Liberty is running in dev mode, and that means that you can then essentially it, it's ready and listening for any changes that you make. Now, if you want to see the application and the different files we have in our in our lab environment here, you just have to head to the Explorer. And then if I make this a bit larger so you can see it. And then if you click on the arrows, you'll be able to see all of the subdirectories within that uh, within that sort of head directory or main directory. As I said, we're utilizing start. If you want to see how it looks when it's finished, head to the finish directory. But we're just going to do everything in start for just now. And all our code can be found inside the SRC directory. Now, because we're doing a module here about testing, we're not going to be taking a look at the main code within the application itself. We're mostly going to be focusing on this test directory, this subdirectory here. So go ahead and open that up and you should see the file that we're going to be editing in a moment. So I'm just going to close that for just now. We're still going with this. Wait for it to finish. It does take a little bit of time, but once it's up, it makes sort of any changes that you make, especially when you're a developer and you're trying to do like iterative changes and check that they work, it can be really useful to see that that works either immediately or if it doesn't work immediately. So it's just updating. Uh, there we go. So Liberty is running in dev mode. So there's our message to say that we're ready uh, to begin sort of utilizing it in that dev mode. So you should see that message come up if you've done this lab, if you're doing this lab at the same time. So in order to sort of start tests, we just have to enter the, we just have to press the enter key and that will run our tests on demand. So if we hit the enter key now, it should then go ahead and essentially do our integration, any integration tests we have currently running. So here we go. And as you can see, we've got one test that was able to run and run ran successfully. So let's go and check out the test that we have already in there. So as I said, we're, used to, we're doing a module on testing, so you want to head to the test uh, subdirectory within our sort of file system. And we're going to head to this class called person service IT. So if we open that up, I'm just going to close down my Explorer just so you can see my, my code a bit bigger. So we can ignore all of that stuff at the top, just comments. So here is our one test that we ran just now in dev mode. If you see this message come up, by the way, feel free to just exclude globally, um, and then it won't come up again for you. So we're going to try and begin bootstrapping this. And so we're going to annotate the person service IT Java class with our app microshare test annotation. If you remember back to my slides, that's the first annotation we need to use to be able to introduce the fact that we're utilizing microshare testing in our testing framework. And so to do that, you can essentially just copy and paste um, what we provided here on the left hand side, or you can look at the differences between the two and you can manually change it yourself completely up to you what you choose. So you can copy and paste that from the left hand side into the right hand side. We provided all the code you need for the class there. Please remember to save. This IDE doesn't automatically save. So please remember to do a shortcut or, or to file save. So here you can see we've introduced the app microshed test, the first annotation we need. Now the next annotation that we need is to annotate it with the at container annotation. So the next class that we provide down below here um, provides some basic information that informs how microshare testing needs to start the application runtime and at which URL path the application will be available. So all that's provided by that at container annotation. So you can see here, if you compare the differences, this is the part that we're adding in. So this at container and we're providing that path and essentially the runtime information that we need when we're setting up that container. So if you just want to copy and paste, you can just select or delete and copy and paste in. But it's nice to be able to sort of compare it before you do that uh, to see the difference. So this was the second annotation I mentioned in that PowerPoint that we need to include. So now that we've got that at, that at microshed uh, testing annotation and that at container annotation, uh, the next thing we need to be able to do is to essentially set up the test that we want. So We've now imported the application container class and the container annotation. We've created the application container application and annotated the application with app container. The with app context root string, which you can see here, this line here, this is the part that indicates the base path of the application. 
So because the app context root is the portion of the URL after the hostname and the port. So in this case, um, the application is deployed to, as you can see on the left hand side here, this URL here. So essentially the app context root is slash guide microshed testing. Then with the readiness path that we've introduced here, this method indicates of what path is polled by HTTP to determine the application readiness. So this is all about, like, is my application ready to be tested? The application I've deployed into that container. So microshed testing automatically starts the application container application and waits for it to be ready before running the tests. If we didn't have that line, we might try run, our, our, the framework might try running essentially the tests that we have before the application is even ready, in which case the tests are going to fail. So it's really important that we make sure the application's up and running before we run those tests. So the next thing we're going to do is open a new terminal so that we can keep Open Liberty running in dev mode, but we're going to open a new terminal so we can do some more commands. So if you go to terminal, new terminal, it will appear in a tab beside your previous terminal. So now, um, in this case, we're going to be utilizing the default application readiness check um, at that URL to be able to see, you know, is my application ready to be up and running? So we can do that by utilizing this curl command. So if we put that curl command in, yeah, you can see that our status is up. So that means our application is good to go. So as I said before, make sure you save your changes before moving on to the next stage. So we now need to make sure that our application is able to talk uh, through the use of a REST client. So with microshed testing, um, applications are essentially exercised in a very black box fashion. And that means that the tests can't access the application internals at all. Instead, the application is exercised from the outside. And usually we do that with HTTP requests. So to be able to simplify those interactions, we inject a REST client into the tests. And that, that was mentioned in the slides as well when I said the, app, the annotation that we were utilizing, which is the at REST client, as you can see here, this is what we're adding in this stage, that at REST client, we're injecting that REST client to be able to essentially um, simplify those HTTP interactions. So again, in the same file, we're gonna copy and paste this code in, uh, or you can manually add that change in yourself if you'd like to. I'm just going to make it easy and just copy and paste right now. So essentially, uh, with that at rest annotation, what we're doing is that the person service class is essentially being injected um, and essentially we're using that for our application. So the instance that gets injected is a REST client proxy. So if you were to call, for example, um, person svc dot create person. So we're trying to create a person here, Bob, and he's 42. The REST client will then make a HTTP post request to the application that then that's running uh, at the URL that we specified, which remember was that localhost 9080 and then that uh, end part, which was guide microshed testing and then slash people, which then will trigger the corresponding Java method within the application. So you can see how our tests aren't the ones that are actually, um, ha that have the access to the internals. We're doing it all through that HTTP, those HTTP requests. So, now that we've done all the setup and all of that's complete, as you can see, it didn't take that much time. We can now write our first test case. So we're going to be testing the very basic create person use case for our REST based application. So to be able to test this use case, we're going to use the REST client that's already injected by Microshed testing to be able to make that HTTP post request to the application and then read the response. So again, we need to be editing that person service IT class. So in this case, we're adding in this test here. So previously where we just had sort of a blank test, we're actually going to be trying to create a person in this one. So again, you can either manually do that change yourself or just copy and paste the entire uh, class, the new class. So you can see this is essentially what we've added. Please remember to save the changes as well in this one. Um, but essentially what we're doing here is we're utilizing the assert null static method to be able to test that we were able to successfully create that person, in this case, Hank. So once we save our changes, because we're already running uh, Open Liberty dev mode, we're able to just return to that original terminal. And in this case, you can see here the test compilation was successful. So it's automatically recompiling our, our application with the new code that we've, we've saved. So now I can literally just hit enter and the, and the application will be tested again. So in this case, we're going to be using a, a container. So you can see here it says starting one container for our test person service IT. So you can see that we were able to run that test uh, and it successfully passed. 
So the next stage, now that we know we're able to use that container, we're able to test that simple one simple test that we had. Let's add more tests. Let's see how it does. So in this one, we're going to add some more tests and we're going to make them a bit harder. So now we're testing, OK, can I check the minimum size of name that we have to have? Can I test the minimum age? Can I test whether I can get a person as well as create a person? Can I test whether I can get everyone that I have access to within this application? And can I update someone's age? So we're introducing a lot more tests here. So again, you can either manually or copy and paste it in. Again, we're utilizing things like assert equals. You know, all of this is generic J unit uh, testing. We're just doing it in an application so that we can really test our integration between various components in that true to production environment. So again, we can utilize dev mode. You can notice how quick it is because I'm not having to restart my application or recompile and it's doing it sort of on the fly. It's really quick. So again, just hit enter into that tab where you've got Open Liberty dev mode running. And now you can see that we're actually um, you know, running our application and we're able to test those various different tests. So now we've got six tests and they've all run successfully. So a great start there. So if you wanted to run these tests in development, 